Uh, I'll have to begin by uh, <clears throat> apologizing for the state of my voice. Apparently, since I got here, I've been talking too much and too loudly, and it's uh, beginning to depart from me. <clears throat> However, I hope you'll be able to make out uh, most of what I have to say, at least. <clears throat> Can you hear that talk there? Any, any, any hope? No. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it'll improve in time. <laughs> <clears throat> the uh, proposition that humans differ in fundamental respects from other organisms in the natural world is hardly open to serious dispute. If, a, if an extraterrestrial uh, scientist were to come to study earthly matters, he would have very little doubt on this score. And the conclusion would be particularly obvious if he were to study the uh, changes that occur in the life of organisms over an extended period. The humans of today are, with at most minor modifications, of the same genetic constitution as their forebears uh, many millennia ago. But patterns of life have changed remarkably, particularly in the past few hundred years. This is certainly not true of other organisms except as a result of human intervention. A Martian observer would also be struck by the fact that at any moment of history, there are remnants of earlier ways, even of Stone Age conditions, among humans who do not differ significantly in genetic constitution from those whose mode of life has changed most radically. He would note, in short, that humans are unique in the natural world in that they have a history, they have cultural diversity and cultural evolution. In these respects, humans are qualitatively different from all other species, and as a scientist, our hypothetical Martian might well be intrigued by the question, why is this so? This same question has, of course, been raised in one or another form since the earliest recorded origins of human thought, a fact which is natural enough. Humans naturally seek to define their place in the world of nature. The question, what is human nature, what is the collection of attributes that so radically distinguish the human species from the rest of the organic world, is a profound and essentially unanswered question of science. It has, uh, in the past, been held to lie beyond the range of scientific inquiry in that the specific difference of humans lies in their possession of an immortal soul that cannot, in fact, be further understood by the methods of science. Assuming that there are no a priori limits to scientific inquiry, then it will be an empirical question, a question of science, to determine what, in fact, human nature may be. Uh, while this is, in the first case, a scientific question, it also is a question that has more than scientific interest. For example, it lies at the core of, of social thought. What is a good society? Presumably, it's one that leads to the satisfaction of intrinsic human needs insofar as material conditions allow. To command attention and respect, a social theory should be grounded on some concept of human needs and human rights, and in turn on the human nature that must be presupposed in any account of the origin and the character of these needs and rights. Correspondingly, the social structures and the relations that a reformer or a revolutionary seeks to bring into existence will be based on some concept of human nature, perhaps implicit. Suppose, for example, that at the core of human nature lies the propensity to truck and barter, as Adam Smith alleged. In that case, we will work to achieve a, a kind of early capitalist society of small traders unhindered by state intervention by monopoly or by socially controlled production. Suppose, in contrast, that we were to take seriously the concepts of another classical liberal thinker, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who contends that to inquire and to create, these are the centers around which all human pursuits more or less directly revolve, and who further maintains that true creation can take place only under conditions of freedom that what does not spring from a man's free choice or is only the result of instruction and guidance does not enter into his very being but remains alien to his true nature. 
and who holds further, these are all quotes, that human development presupposes social bonds, since the isolated man is no more able to develop than the one who is fettered. Or as Marx, who was, of course, much influenced by French and German romanticism, would later write, only in a state of community with others has each individual the means to develop his predispositions in all directions. Only in a state of community will personal freedom thus become possible, where personal freedom presupposes abolition of the alienation of labor, which casts some of the workers back into a barbarous kind of work and turns others into machines, and denies what Marx called the species character of humans, which lies in free conscious activity and productive life. On such assumptions as these about human nature, we derive a very different conception of a social order that one should labor to create. And in fact, similar considerations hold even if one adopts the view of some Marxists that man has no essence apart from his historical existence. For even if we were to agree with Marx that, I'm quoting, the nature which comes to be in human history is man's real nature and nothing else, then it still remains true that the next step in social change should seek to provide the conditions under which uh, the real nature can be expressed at a given stage of historical and cultural evolution. Well, I'm not going to pursue these questions, though they are quite interesting. I mention them only to recall two facts of some importance. First, the quest for real human nature is not motivated solely by intellectual curiosity, though in fact that would suffice, but rather it's a matter of deep human concern with significant consequences for social and individual life. And secondly, for this very reason, the question human nature is often approached not in the spirit of the sciences without dogmatic preconception, but rather on the basis of ideological conviction and often with quite considerable passion. That is understandable, but unfortunate, precisely because the question does have significant implications for human life. One ought to make a special effort to free inquiry from the chains of doctrine and a priori principle and to pursue factual inquiry where, wherever it may lead. How can we proceed to study human nature? A useful point of departure is to note that human nature has a strictly physical component, and we think we know how to go about studying that. Well, how do we, in fact, proceed in that case? A rational approach would be to select some reasonably self-contained physical system of the body, some bodily organ, let's say, and to try to determine its nature. Suppose we've done this in a number of cases, then we might proceed uh, to a higher level of analysis and to ask how organs so studied interact in a broader system, how they grow and develop and so on. Let's consider the kinds of questions that we might ask about an organ of the body. Take as an example the eye or perhaps better the, the entire visual system regarded as an organ. What kind of questions would we ask about it and seek to, uh, in, in determining its nature? First, uh, we may ask questions about the function of the organ. That is, what does it do or what is it for? Second, we can ask questions about the structure of the organ. That is, what are the principles in accordance with which it is organized? Third question following from that has to do with its physical basis. That is, how are these structural principles of organization actually realized in the physical system, in this case, the physical system of the brain? Fourth, we can ask questions about development. That is, how does the system come to assume its mature form and under what conditions? How do nature and nurture interact and within what kind of limits and the growth of the organ? And fifth, we can ask questions about evolutionary development. That is, how did the genetically determined aspects of the organ come to be as they are for the species in the course of its, its development? Well, pursuing these fundamental questions with regard to the visual system, what roughly do we find? Well, we find something like this. We first, we note that we discover that the organism begins in some genetically determined initial state, 
which we can take to be common for the species, apart from pathology or minor variations which we can describe. Uh, beginning in the initial state, the organism then passes, the organ in question then passes through a sequence of successive states until it achieves a mature, final, steady state, which then undergoes only very marginal changes uh, as in, in further, through further life. So by some time, uh, rather early, in the early years of life, the organ of vision is essentially fixed in structure, though in fact we can still learn to see in new ways throughout our lives, for example, through exposure to, say, some new form of visual representation in the arts, for example, say, cubism, take a standard example, or by applying knowledge which is gained later in life. The 17th century philosopher Ralph Cudworth put the matter rather nicely uh, in the following way, quote, he said, a skillful and expert limner will observe many elegancies and curiosities of art and be highly pleased with several strokes and shadows in a picture where a common eye can discern nothing at all. And a musical artist, hearing a consort of exact musicians playing some excellent composure of many parts, will be exceedingly ravished with many harmonical airs and touches that a vulgar ear will be utterly insensible of. Classical rational psychology of that period assumed that it was the mind, not the physical eye, that was responsible for these more subtle accomplishments. Uh, nowadays, few people uh, would want to deny that some kind of physical change is responsible for the fact that the skilled and expert limner will be sensible of much that escapes the common eye. But still, the essential point that rational psychology asserted can be restated in our terms. That is, we can state that these later accomplishments are, these later are, are based on a, an interaction of the organ of sight, that is the eye and the visual cortex, with other organs and faculties that enter into the full cognitive system. It makes very good sense, as, a, as an extremely good first approximation at least, to suppose that the organ of vision reaches something like its final mature state rather early in life, though not at birth, and then through interaction with other cognitive systems allows us to learn to see in new and uh, unexpected ways. In the past 10 or 15 years, there's been very exciting and important work on the nature and the growth of the organ of vision, work which I think uh, is extremely suggestive uh, with regard to the a more elusive and difficult problem of studying uh, cognitive structures. There's a recent summary in science, from which I'll quote, uh, of the, char the general character of the results achieved in terms of what's called there a principle of restricted potential, which runs like this, quoting, the developing nervous system is not a tabula rasa free to reflect whatever individual experience dictates. Rather, the development of the nervous system is a process sharply constrained by a genetic program. At certain points, the genetic program permits a range of possible realizations, and individual experience acts only to specify the outcome within this range. So, for example, a, an individual neuron will respond to a line in a particular orientation but there is some genetically determined range of possible orientations uh, for any particular uh, neuron, and the specificity of orientation is then realized by experience within that range. And similarly, the general character of binocular vision is genetically programmed, but the very precise control of matching of inputs from the two eyes would be determined by visual experience. And these are rather typical observations. Uh, during this period, studies of the mammalian visual system have made some progress in determining in the first place the, the general structural principles of organization, and in second place, the physical basis for these principles. And furthermore, they've made some progress in sorting out the genetically determined properties of the initial state that set the range within which experience can fix a particular realization. Those are the second and third and fourth questions that I mentioned. 
The fifth question is to determine how this genetically determined initial state developed through evolution. That's a fair question, but it's obviously a problem of an entirely different order than, studying, than that of studying the development of the organ. Uh, it's in connection with this final question, with the question of evolution, that questions of function arise in a significant way. No one supposes that children learn to have an eye capable of sight because it would be useful for this function to be fulfilled. The function of the eye is no doubt to see, but that observation is not a very interesting contribution to the study of transition from the initial to the steady state of the organism. Rather, it's in the context of inquiry into phylogenetic development and evolution that functional questions have their real interest, so it would seem. Well, I've mentioned all this because I think that the reasonably well understood properties of the visual system and the success in inquiry into it in these five domains that I mentioned does provide, I think, a suggestive and helpful model for investigation of other aspects of human nature. And in this context, let's turn to my topic, which is inquiry into human language. Exactly how human language is intertwined in some more general system of knowledge, some more general system of belief, that's a question that's been very much debated and is by no means resolved. Nevertheless, it seems reasonable, I think, without question, to abstract away from these interconnections, whatever they may prove to be, and to consider a certain idealization, the idealization of language as a self-contained mental organ, analogous in important respects to the visual system. Notice that when we study the visual system, we begin by undertaking a rather comparable idealization. That is, the visual system is, of course, not divorced from other physical and mental structures. Similarly, if we were to investigate the heart, let's say, we would be looking at that organ from a particular point of view, abstracting away from an intricate uh, web of interconnections. And in fact, uh, the same is true even if we study an organism, a particular organism as a thing, let's say, uh, an individual to be subjected to study uh, independently of the environment in which it subsists. One might, after all, study an organism in the natural world from a very different point of view. One might, say, study the flow of nutrients or the oxygen carbon dioxide cycle. And if we were to do that, then the organism would disappear in a system of stages of complex chemical processes. It would, in fact, lose its integrity from that point of view as an individual placed in an environment. It's a familiar point. The familiar point is that any kind of rational inquiry presupposes abstraction, presupposes idealization, adoption of one rather than another point of view, putting to the side phenomena that are of lesser relevance or no relevance from the standpoint adopted for inquiry. These moves of idealization and abstraction can be justified only indirectly in terms of the results obtained, the principles revealed within the framework that they have imposed. I dwell on this point since although it's taken for granted without any particular discussion in the physical sciences, nevertheless it's been in the source of a great deal of confusion and regarded as somehow illegitimate in the study of mind. And I uh, simply want to stress that it's not illegitimate. In fact, it's a prerequisite to any kind of serious study. So let me summarize then. When we identify human language as a kind of mental organ, we are not, of course, implying that it is divorced from other systems or that the range of mental phenomena might not be studied or viewed from some other standpoint. Rather, we're proposing a certain idealization, and this idealization will be legitimate if, in fact, it leads to the discovery of principles of some significance and some depth. And in this case, I think there's very good reason to believe that the idealization is legitimate because it does lead to such principles. Well, considering language as a mental organ, what do we observe? Well, we, as in the case of the visual system, we note that each person, again, apart from severe defect, reaches a steady state of linguistic development at a relatively fixed age, say, by puberty. Beyond that point, there are modifications, but they seem quite marginal. However, transition from the initial state to the attained steady state does involve quite rapid qualitative changes. 
Across the human species, the ability to acquire a language is fixed and variant within very narrow limits. Noting this, we can assume, as in the case of the visual system, a fixed initial state, genetically determined, that permits a range of possible realizations where individual experience acts only to specify the outcome within this range. At least that would be a very reasonable first guess on the assumption that this mental organ resembles other systems which are known in the natural world. And I see no reason to doubt that, at least as an initial step. Qualitative considerations alone indicate that the range of possible uh, realizations that are permitted by the genetic program must be quite a narrow range. Why is that? Well, in the first place, it's obvious that the final steady state attained is highly complex and articulated in fantastic detail. And furthermore, it's quite uniform across uh, for, for individuals uh, within what's called a given speech community. Furthermore, it's obvious that the steady state attained is vastly underdetermined by the experience and avail available to us. Put it differently, we know vastly more than we've experienced, and what is known is quite comparable uh, among individuals uh, in a given speech community. Now, a neutral scientist who is studying humans with no dogmatic preconceptions might well conclude, and should conclude, I think, that language grows in the individual much in the way that the visual system grows. Qualitatively, the two systems seem parallel. And he would conclude then, I think, that humans learn English uh, only in the sense in which they learn to have precise binocular coordination or a particular distribution of orientation specificities for the neurons of the visual cortex. Consideration of the vast scope and complexity and essential uniformity of our linguistic knowledge on the one hand, and on the other, the highly restricted and degenerate quality of the evidence available suggests at once that the range of possible realizations permitted by human genetics must be quite narrow. On any other assumption, there would be no way to account for the uniform attainment of a very rich and complex and intricate steady state uh, under very weak external conditions. This is as true in the case of language as it is in the case of the analog, the visual system. Well, what about the initial state that we have to postulate? This initial state has to specify a rather limited class of possible languages that can be acquired by humans in the normal way, uh, that can grow in the human organism, in other words, uh, within whatever boundary conditions are set by experience. If the init initial genetically determined restriction is sufficiently severe, then it will be possible for the child to attain a system of vast complexity on the basis of limited data, data which is sufficient to rule out all possibilities, say for one or perhaps a few. That is, the child will then know the language which is compatible with his limited experience, though there will be no relation of, of generalization or abstraction or induction or whatever, relating the system attained, which is the attained final state, to the boundary condition set by experience. The child's initial state, then, will lay down the general principles of language structure, providing a schematism of rich and intricate detail, which will determine, in the first place, the contents of linguistic experience, and in the second place, the specific system of knowledge, the specific language, that is constrained by that experience. But the relation between experience and knowledge may be, and I think in fact is when we investigate, very abstract. The principles of language structure that are incorporated in the initial state express this relationship, and there is no other way to express it. Once the steady state is attained, then knowledge of language and skill in using language can still be refined, exactly as in the case of learning to see. To my knowledge, Wilhelm von Humboldt, again, was the first to insist that the resources of a language can be enriched by a great writer or thinker without any change in the grammar. An individual can increase the, his facility or the subtlety of his comprehension of the devices of language 
either through his own creative activities, through immersion in the cultural wealth of his society. But as in the case of the visual system, it seems quite appropriate to set this matter aside in abstracting the linguistic system as a separate object of study, which attains its fixed steady state at some fixed point of, of uh, individual development. Well, this is rather metaphoric and vague, but we need not content ourselves, ourselves with these metaphoric and vague proposals. Best, what should be done at this point, what can be done, is to spell out precisely the mechanisms, the schematisms that do characterize the initial state. These principles are what are sometimes called principles of universal grammar. We may think of universal grammar from this point of view just as the genetic program that is the schematism that determines the range of possible realizations which are in fact the possible human languages. So each such possible realization is one possible steady state which can be attained in principle by a human being. We can call each such realization, each steady state, a grammar, the grammar of a specific language, a representation of the knowledge that we have of that language if we attain it. So from thinking in this way, what has traditionally been called universal grammar, is a system which is genetically determined at the initial state and which is then specified and sharpened and articulated under the boundary conditions given by experience to yield the particular grammars, the particular systems of knowledge that are represented in the steady states attained. If we look at the question of growth of language in this fashion, we can see how it's possible for a person to know vastly more than he has experienced. And the fundamental problem in psychology or epistemology is to explain that fact, to explain that we can know so much when we've experienced so little. Well, an approach of this sort uh, stands in rather sharp contrast with more familiar learning models in accordance with which it's assumed that a language, like other systems, is a system of habits or of skills which is acquired through generalization or conditioning, induction, abstraction, in general in a process of gradual accretion. From this point of view, linguistic knowledge is, is a system of learned, maybe overlearned categories and patterns. An approach of this sort can also be made explicit in various ways and in fact has been, for example, in behavioral psychology and in structural linguistics. So here we have two contrasting approaches. Uh, Notice that under either of these contrasting approaches, we have to assume a genetically fixed initial state. The approaches don't differ in that respect. They differ in their conception of what this initial state is, what its nature is. One approach takes the initial state to be a rich system of principles, a restrictive schematism that specifies the range of possible languages. The other approach takes the initial state to be a system of learning mechanisms, of procedures, taxonomic procedures, data processing procedures, procedures of generalization or induction and so on, which are to be applied to the data of experience to give knowledge of language and presumably applied to any other data to give some other system of knowledge. I think it's correct and useful to regard these two approaches as, as in roughly the form in which I've described them, as modern variants of classical ideas in particular of classical rationalism and classical empiricism, respectively. Naturally, one can study approaches of a mixed sort, of various sorts, but I think it's very useful to keep in mind these two general models, each of which can have several possible variants as points of reference. Well, the rationalist approach, as I've outlined it, states that the initial genetically determined state of the organism consists of a set of principles that constrains the class of possible systems of knowledge, possible languages that we can acquire. And looking at the mental organ language in this fashion, it conceives of language very much on the model of other known biological systems, in fact, of every known biological system. The empiricist model, on the other hand, sees language as being dramatically different from any known biological system. Now, as I've said, the and for this reason, for these reasons, these Piagetian models don't seem to me to be a genuine alternative. And uh, 
far as I know, there are no general principles at all within developmental psychology that shed any light on the questions that I've been discussing. So I'm going to put the interactions constructivist models to the side, that is, I don't think that they are substantive alternatives, and limit attention to, these, to the empiricist and rationalist models and compare those. general principles at all within developmental psychology that shed any light on the questions that I've been discussing. So I'm going to put the interactionist constructivist models to the side, that is, I don't think that they are substantive alternatives, and limit attention to, these, to the empiricist and rationalist models and compare those. Uh, I've argued for the rationalist model here and elsewhere, but let me stress that the empiricist models seem much more in accord with our normal way of discussing the development of language. So, for example, we, do, we don't say, we, we say uh, that the child learns language. We don't say that the child grows language or that language matures. On the other hand, we say that we don't, uh, 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 we do not say, for example, that the embryo or the child learns to have arms rather than legs or that he learns to have a visual system of a particular kind, or that he learns to have, say, mature sexual organs to take a case of development that we assume to be genetically determined, though it takes place well after birth. And in this manner of talk, we distinguish quite sharply in our normal discourse between the alleged learning of language and the alleged growth or development of physical systems. How seriously one ought to take that distinction, I think, is very much open to question. We also say that the sun rises, but nobody, we know why we say that, and no astronomer is much concerned about the fact, and I think we can be equally unconcerned, uh, except to explain with the uh, fact that we speak of learning rather than growing language. In addition to this, it's an, another relevant fact, perhaps, is that we're we're naturally impressed with the divergence, the diversity of attested languages as compared with the apparent uniformity of physical organs. And again, I think it's entirely natural that in our normal lives we should take this point of view. Why so? Well, the reason is that in our normal lives there isn't any reason for us to pay any attention to the uniformities among individuals or the uniformities across cultures. These we can take for granted. It's the differences that are interesting. Similarly, I assume that a frog takes for granted that any reasonable creature is like him in interesting respects, and he pays attention only to the differences among frogs. For the scientists looking at frogs, that may not seem so evident. <laughs> However, regarding ourselves as a frog looks at himself, uh, we too will take for granted the uniformities and should. It's a waste of time to pay attention to them in normal life, and we'll pay attention to the differences. So take, for example, the situation of, say, learning a foreign language. What do we do? Well, we concentrate solely on the respects in which this language differs from our own. And a good teaching grammar, a grammar that you'll use for instruction, will say virtually nothing about general properties of language, nor should it. Why? Because these grammars are designed for use by the intelligent reader, and therefore they don't have to provide an analysis of the intelligence that the intelligent reader brings to bear. Typically, these grammars will discuss irregularities, but they will not discuss deeper principles of universal grammar, which are for the most part unknown, and which even if known can be taken for granted. Let me take, uh, they can be taken for granted because we're humans. Uh, to bring this down to earth a little bit, let's take a concrete example. Suppose that we're trying to teach somebody English and uh, we want to teach him, say, how to form questions in English. Well, we would have to tell him that to form questions, uh, he has to, uh, well, for example, given a sentence like, John is tall, to form the corresponding question, you have to take the occurrence of the verb is that appears in it and put it in the front of the sentence, giving, is John tall? That has to be taught. That's an idiosyncrasy of English. It's an irregularity, if you like. Uh, questions could have been formed in some other way, and in fact are formed in other ways in many other languages.
And a, a, a teaching grammar, I'll have to say that, you know, I'll have to somehow tell you that the way you form a question from John is tall is by putting is in front, getting is John tall. However, no traditional grammar and no teaching grammar will bother to tell anyone that you can't take an occurrence of the word is that appears within a relative clause and put it in the front. So, for example, suppose you're given the sentence, the man who is here is tall, and you've learned that the way to form a question is by putting the verb is in front. Well, in that sentence, there were two occurrences of the verb is. The man who is here is tall. But no teaching grammar has to bother to tell you that it's the second one, not the first one, that you prepose. The sentence again, the man who is here is tall. If you were to prepose the first occurrence of is, you'd get something like, is the man who here is tall. Obviously no good. If you were to prepose the second one, you would get, is the man who is here tall. Now, none of these things have to be stated, and I'm sort of certain without inquiry that no teaching grammar ever describes such facts. Probably no one ever thought of bothering to describe such facts. Uh, quite similarly, children who are learning English don't ever make such mistakes. That is, they never say things like, is the man who is, here, sorry, is the man who here is tall. They never make such mistakes. They make all kinds of mistakes, but not that kind. And they're never instructed not to make such mistakes, which is to say that children know without instruction and indeed without experience that it's impossible to form a question by extracting the word is from a relative clause and preposing it, as in the case of is the man who here is tall. In fact, the whole issue seems absurd. Uh, and it is absurd. It is entirely absurd from the point of view of normal life. Why? Because in normal life, we take normal intelligence for granted. And normal intelligence somehow informs us without any specific, you know, without any diversity among languages or among possible systems attained, that there's got to be some principle that, you know, that you cannot extract the verb is from the embedded relative clause. So from the point of view of normal life, the whole issue is, in fact, absurd. But it's far from absurd if you adopt the point of view of the scientist. That is, adopt the point of view of, again, that extraterrestrial visitor doesn't know anything about human beings and has no special insight into human intelligence and who wants to discover what human nature is. That is, a scientist who's concerned to analyze, to discover, and then to analyze the principles that constitute the intelligence of the intelligent reader. So, again, taking this, say, Martian scientist observing humans, Suppose that he were trying to understand the transition from the initial to the final state in the case of the mental organ language. And suppose that he's observing people like us and he notices, say, that we form questions and that the way we do it is by taking sentences like, John is tall, and turning them into, is John tall, the man is tall, is the man tall, and so on. Well, what would he conclude? A rational conclusion on the basis of evidence of that sort would be that the way we do it is, this might be a hypothesis that a sensible Martian scientist might propose. He might say, well, what they're doing plainly is taking declarative sentences and finding the first occurrence of the verb is that appears in the declarative sentence and putting it in the front. Well, that's a very, very simple rule. And in fact, it's a rule that works virtually all the time. You'd have to look pretty hard to find a case where it doesn't work. In other words, it's a rule that's confirmed, it's a hypothesis that's confirmed by really quite massive evidence. Of course, we know it's wrong. We know that it's wrong because we can falsify it with sentences like, is the man who is here tall? But, uh, and, and that sentence, in fact, shows us that we don't prepose the first occurrence of the verb is, but rather, well, what is it that we do? we take the first occurrence of the verb is that follows the subject of the sentence, and we prepose that one. Now, compare two rules. One, the Martians guess they prepose the first verb is, and two, the actual fact, they prepose the first occurrence of the verb is that follows the subject of the sentence. You compare these two rules and think of them as two scientific hypotheses, and it's quite obvious that the second one, the true one, is far more complex and intricate than the false one. That is, the true hypothesis requires analysis of the sentence into abstract phrases, and notice that those are not physically realized in the sentence at all. 
there isn't any mark in the sentence that tells you where the subject ends, let's say, or even that there is such a notion. Uh, and suppose that our Martian scientist had gotten this far, that is, he tried his first hypothesis and discovered that it was working for a long time and then finally noticed sentences like, is the man who was here tall and then got the right hypothesis? Well, if he had proceeded in that way, he would certainly, if rational, want to know why it is that we do it. And in fact, suppose he further noticed that children always try the more complicated rule first. They never try the simple rule. That is, children never make, again, never make mistakes like, is the man who here is tall? Now, if a scientist, knowing nothing about humans, observed this, he would have to conclude that for some reason to be explained, children without experience, without evidence, are always hitting on an extremely complex and abstract rule and are somehow ignoring a perfectly obvious and simple rule, namely the rule that says take the first occurrence of is and put it in front of the sentence. And he'd want to know why they do that strange thing. Why don't they ever make such mistakes as is the man who here is tall? Why don't they carry out induction over the simple property first rather than why do they carry out induction over the far more complicated property first after the subject? Well, that's a, again, let me repeat, for normal life, this is an absurd question because we naturally assume unconsciously the properties of specifically human intelligence. But for the inquiry into human nature, in contrast, what is significant is precisely what we never attend to in daily life. And correspondingly, it's precisely what is omitted in traditional grammar, what is omitted in teaching grammar, that is deep and significant from the point of view of inquiry into the nature of language. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that the same is true of the inquiry into human nature quite generally. What is assumed as natural in our daily lives is precisely what demands explanation. Why do we develop the specific cognitive systems that we do? Why don't we develop others that are no less consistent with the data available to us and that are quite often, as in the case of the example I just gave, much more simple, much simpler than the constructions that in fact we do develop? As far as I can see, to these questions there's only one possible answer, namely some genetic program determines the specific structures that we're allowed to acquire, some kind of rationalist approach. The constructions that we develop are those which fall within the range of the genetically determined program, this being a program which restricts very narrowly the uh, constructions of our intelligence, and by the same token permits us to acquire a very complex and in fact vast system of knowledge on the basis of the very limited data available to us. So to return to the persuasiveness of empiricist models, we can easily understand, I think, why they should have arisen, why they seem compelling, why people should say, learn language rather than grow language. Uh, and uh, we can, in other words, why one should think intuitively of language as being learned rather than as growing like the visual system or the sexual organs or whatever in accordance with a fixed schematism. The reason is simple. The irregularities of language, which are the only thing that concern us, are learned. Conceivably, they're even learned by the methods investigated in learning theory, though that's more dubious. Uh, in exactly the same sense, the distribution of vertical and horizontal receptors in the visual system is learned. We learn how to do the high jump and so on, but we don't learn how to have arms and legs. We don't learn to walk rather than to fly. We don't learn to have binocular vision with analysis of stimuli in terms of linear contours. And we don't learn to adhere to the principle that linguistic rules have to be stated in terms of phrases instead of in terms of linear order of words. All of these conditions are fixed as elements of a genetically determined initial state characterized in some kind of universal grammar. Well, at the outset, when I was talking about uh, the visual systems model, I mentioned five general kinds of questions that one might raise with regard to an organ, such as, say, the visual system. Again, what were these? Questions of function, structure, physical basis for structure, development in the individual, and uh, development in the species, evolutionary development. So that's five dimensions of inquiry. I also noted in the case of the visual system 
that the first kind of question, that is questions of function, arise in an interesting way in the context of the fifth kind of question, that is inquiry into evolutionary development, not in the context of inquiry into individual growth and learning. Well, I've been talking about language now, and I've only been mentioning, so far I've only mentioned the fourth of these questions, that is the question of development in the individual. And again, what I suggested is that the genetically determined initial state limits the range of accessible languages by stipulating a rich and restrictive schematism that these attained languages must meet, so that a rich system of knowledge can be acquired on the basis of limited data. Now, let me stress the following point to which I want to return later, namely that there's a sort of a logical relation, an essential logical relation between the scope and the limits of knowledge. Why is that? Well, the reason is that we can attain knowledge of vast scope on the basis of limited data only if the form of the attained system of knowledge is largely predetermined by certain given principles. Otherwise, it's impossible. In fact, otherwise, immense numbers of possible theories, possible systems of knowledge would be compatible with our limited evidence. We'd have no way to select among them, and we couldn't attain rich and complex knowledge with limited data. So, so that in order to gain rich systems of knowledge, we have to have highly restrictive principles. But of course, these very same principles that underlie the attainment of rich systems of knowledge will also limit the class of attainable systems. With a highly specific system of genetically determined universal grammar available in the initial state, the child can acquire his vast knowledge of language, but correspondingly, there are only certain kinds of language that he's able to learn, namely those conforming to these principles. It's very important to bear in mind this logical relation between the scope of knowledge and the limits, and again, I'll return to it later on. Well, again, I've talked only about the fourth question, development of language. Let's think briefly about the other questions that are raised. First of all, what about the question of the function of language? Well, it's very commonly argued that the function of language is communication, that the essential purpose of language is to enable human beings to communicate with one another, and that only by attending to this essential purpose can we make any sense of the nature of language. Personally, I find it very hard to make any sense of the argument. What does it mean to say that language has some essential purpose, or in particular that its essential purpose is communication? Suppose, say, that in the quiet of my study, I'm thinking about a problem, perhaps thinking in language, and suppose, say, I, even that I write down what I think, or suppose that someone, say, speaks honestly, just out of a sense of integrity, perhaps fully aware that his audience is going to refuse to comprehend or to consider what he's saying. Or consider, that often happens, consider <laughs> informal conversation, which is conducted merely for the purpose of maintaining casual, friendly relations, say, with no particular concern as to the content of, of uh, communication, alleged communication, and so on. Are these things examples of communication? Myriad examples of this sort. Well, if they are, then what do we mean by communication in the absence of an audience, or with an audience assumed to be completely unresponsive, or with no intention to convey information, or to change beliefs and attitudes, and so on? It seems to me that we have two choices. Either we can deprive the notion of communication of any meaning whatsoever and call all of these things communication, or else we have to reject the view that the purpose of language is communication, because certainly these are perfectly standard uses of language. So while it's commonly said, in fact, it's virtually a cliche, that the purpose of language is communication, and while much is made of this alleged insight, I don't know of any intelligible formulation of the idea, so I drop it. Well, now let's turn to, are, are there perhaps more, more interesting things that can be said about function? Yes, I think there are, and let me think of some examples. A more serious proposal is that certain kinds of functional considerations determine somehow the character of linguistic rules. Well, again, let me take a concrete and extremely simple example from English. In English, uh, we can form embedded clauses, like, as in sentences like, say, uh, John believes that it is raining, where the clause that it is raining is embedded. And that clause began with the word that, okay? John believes that it is raining. And there's a rule of English that tells us that we can drop the word that sometimes. So we can say, John believes that it is raining, or John believes it is raining. 
Uh, there's sometimes where you can do it. There's sometimes where you can't. Well, one place where you can't do it is when the clause is in the initial position in a sentence, when it begins the sentence. So if I have the sentence, that John is intelligent is obvious, I can't drop the word that and get John is intelligent is obvious. Okay, that's not a sentence of English. John believe, I believe John is intelligent is a sentence of English. John is intelligent is obvious isn't a sentence of English. You can drop the word that in one case, you can't in the other. Why? Well, here's a case where one might suggest, and people have suggested a functional explanation, and let's think carefully about the logic of that explanation. Suppose we, uh, here's the explanation, which seems plausible. Let's assume that there's a kind of a perceptual strategy that we use in understanding sentences. And the perceptual strategy works like this. It says, find the first noun phrase, verb, predicate structure that you come across and take that to be the main clause of the sentence and then fit in everything else somehow so it makes sense. Suppose that we use a perceptual strategy of roughly that sort. And then suppose we were to hear the sentence, John is intelligent is obvious. In other words, suppose that English were permitted to drop that in that position. So we could say, John is intelligent is obvious. Well, applying this perceptual strategy, we'd be in trouble because we'd hear John is intelligent and the perceptual strategy would tell us that's the main clause. And then what are the words is obvious doing at the end? There's no way to make any sense out of those. So the perceptual strategy would be foiled if we could delete that in sentence initial position. Or to put it differently, the sentence, the sentence initial occurrence of the word that is in effect an instruction to us which says don't use that perceptual strategy. In contrast, the word that has no comparable function after verbs, so therefore it can be deleted. Well, there's the outline of a, of a theory, of a, an explanation. Let's suppose that that explanation is correct. If it is, then it accounts for the fact that English has a specific rule of that deletion rather than some other imaginable rule. Now, what does all of this mean? Well, let's think about it. We have to ask the question, is it a genetically determined property of universal grammar that the rule of that deletion has to be restricted to post-verbal position? Or, in the other possibility, is it a fact that has to be learned through experience? These are exhaustive alternatives. And notice that whatever the answer is, uh, in either case, the functional explanation offered applies solely on the evolutionary level. Either it applies on the level of evolution of the organism, if the fact is that the principle is one of universal grammar, or it applies on the level of evolution of the language, if it's not a principle of universal grammar. In the latter case, English evolved in such a way as to facilitate the perceptual strategy but the rule itself has to be learned. So in this case, in the case of this functional explanation for why a certain thing happens in English, we see that, uh, as we would expect from thinking about the logic of functional explanation, that the explanation takes on its significance in connection with the study of the evolution of the system, not in connection with the study of its structure or its development of the organism. And it seems to me entirely reasonable to search for functional explanations of that sort and to think about the processing strategies that might possibly underlie them. However, when we do this, we have to be very careful to distinguish processing strategies from rules of grammar. These are very different animals. The processing strategies are things like the, the strategy that I suggested, you know, take the first noun phrase, verb, predicate, and take it to be the main clause. The rules of grammar, on the other hand, these are rules that determine the intrinsic sound and meaning of the sentence. So in the case of the expression, John is intelligent is obvious, the rules of English grammar determine that the sentence is not well formed. If the functional explanation is correct, English grammar has this rule because of a perceptual strategy, but that's another matter that arises on the evolutionary level. Now let's take another case, which I think works quite differently to perhaps sharpen the point. Suppose that you're, this is, I give now an example due to Tom Bever, as the last one was. Suppose that you're presented with the following sentence or the following expression. The horse raced, the horse raced past the barn, fell. Again, the horse raced past the barn, fell. Well, 
when people are presented with that word sequence, they usually look puzzled. Uh, I hope you're puzzled. And they usually judge that it's not a well-formed sentence. Let me say it again. The, the horse raced past the barn, Phil. Why? Well, it begins with a well-formed sentence, namely the horse raced past the barn. But then what's the word fell doing at the end? That's the question. Well, if you think about it a little, you'll notice that it really is a sentence, in fact, a perfectly good sentence, and it has the meaning, the horse that was raced past the barn fell, analogous to the horse that was taken from the barn fell, or the horse taken from the barn fell, or the horse raced past the barn fell. Okay? Now, uh, notice that you don't have to learn anything new to understand this. You didn't learn any, I didn't teach you anything about English to do that, just sort of Socratic method, you know, give a few examples, <laughs> bring out what you already knew. But on first presentation, the chances are that people would be misled and would think the thing is just some kind of garbage, not, not a sentence. Why could that be? Well, we might again refer to the very same perceptual strategy that I suggested before, the strategy that says look for the first noun phrase, verb, predicate, and take that to be the main clause. If you apply that strategy to the sentence, the horse raced past the barn fell, then you'll take the horse raced past the barn to be a sentence, and you'll be stuck because what's fell doing? On the other hand, if you get the horse taken past the barn fell, you can't do it because taken isn't a verb, it's a participle or something. So the homonymity of the verb raced under that perceptual strategy will mislead you into getting to a point where you can't assign a, an interpretation to the sentence. Now, what's going on here? Notice that in this case, the rules of English grammar don't guarantee that the perceptual strategy will work. On the contrary, the perceptual strategy will fail in this case. We do have a functional explanation, but the explanation is not for the existence of a certain rule, as in the first case. Rather, the explanation is for the normal misperception. However, we don't have any explanation at all for the rules of grammar. So this case is fundamentally different from the case of that deletion, if the earlier explanation was correct. There are many other examples which are often lumped together, but ought to be sharply separated. They function quite differently. Well, inquiry into function, the first of these questions, leads us to questions of evolution on the one hand, that is either evolution of language or evolution of the species, and it also leads to questions of performance, as in the example that I just, just discussed. It leads us to consideration, that is, of how the knowledge of the language that is attained enters into the system of processes by which knowledge is used. And notice that study of the steady state that's attained is concerned both with questions of knowledge, what's called competence sometime, knowledge attained, and concerned with performance, that is, use of the knowledge. The questions are very different ones, but they're intimately related. Well, so much for the first question, namely the question of function. What about the second question, that is, the question of structure of language, the principles by which it's organized? The knowledge that's attained at the steady state, what I've been calling competence, I've said, can be expressed in the form of a grammar, which consists of rules that assign a sound meaning correspondence to an unbounded infinite number of sentences. Now, it's obvious on any you know, thought at all that our knowledge of language is unbounded. There's no limit to it. On the other hand, the rules of grammar have to be a finite system. They're represented in a finite brain. So therefore, these rules have to iterate in some fashion to cover an infinite class of possible sentences and fix their sound and meaning. Furthermore, it seems absolutely beyond question that human language essentially makes use of the notion of phrase, as in the example that I gave before about the questions. So rules of language apply to phrase structures. Now, the most elementary, rudimentary, simple comment that one can make about language is the following. It consists of a system of iterating rules that are structure dependent in that they apply to arrangements of elementary word-like units organized into phrases. That's the simplest elementary property of human language. Beyond this elementary property, we enter into the really interesting questions of linguistic theory, namely what's the character of the rules, which unfortunately I can't even begin to discuss here, so I'll stop. So much for the second question. What about the third? The third question, recall, the third natural question to ask after you've outlined the principles of some organ. Third question is, 
what's its physical realization? What's it, how, how do these principles get realized in the physical structure of the body? What can we say about the physical system in which this abstract theory is realized? Well, in the case of language, for the time being, we can say very little. At a very gross level, there are some things that are known, but they really are gross. So it's known, or at least strongly believed, that language is localized in the dominant hemisphere, which is generally the left hemisphere of the brain. And furthermore, there are some specific areas of that hemisphere that seem to be crucial for language. The little that we know about all of this derives mostly from investigation of aphasia and language deficits. Uh, and there is, in fact, a huge literature on the subject with very few firm conclusions. Now, in principle, one might try to answer these questions by experiment. But of course, in fact, the ethics of human experiment constrain us and make it impossible to answer the questions in the way uh, that a scientist would, would do. Would do. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that this limitation is not a limitation of principle. And again, imagine our extraterrestrial scientist, and let's suppose that he is so magnificently endowed that he regards humans the way we regard fruit flies. Now, for this remarkable creature, it would be entirely clear how to proceed to answer the question, what's the physical system? What would he do? Well, he could conduct all kinds of intrusive experimentation. He could ask how some contrived changes in the environment affect knowledge and use of language and so on. I mention all this just to stress that there aren't any deep philosophical questions that arise specifically in this kind of inquiry. Rather, the fact is that because of limitations on possible experiment, essentially ethical limitations, that you have to be smart enough to think of indirect ways to answer the questions that you can't answer by direct study. Well, for the moment, where do we stand? We can suggest some rather abstract conditions that have to be met by the physical mechanisms of the brain, both at the initial and the final stage. But the study of these mechanisms remains quite elusive, the actual mechanisms themselves. Well, I've said something about the fourth question, namely ontogenetic development. So let me turn finally to the fifth evolution of the species. How did an organism develop with a genetic program determining the initial state with its principles of universal grammar and so on? Again, about this question, there's very little to say. The questions that arise are entirely comparable to questions that can be raised concerning physical organs, and there's not much to say about them either. Uh, there are any really principles of evolution that explain why we have a heart or an eye or something of that sort. Of course, no one finds it in the least bit surprising that we should attribute to the human organism a genetically determined program to develop the intricate physical structures of the body. That we take for granted. But it's a curiosity of our intellectual history that comparable assumptions with regard to mental organs are, have generally evoked deep skepticism or often even outrage or hostility. It's been commonly assumed that there is some kind of a learning theory, that there are some kind of generalized learning strategies that account for the cognitive structures that we attain and the idea that there might be specialized organs, as in the case of the body, has generally be dis been dismissed. And it's furthermore been supposed that these learning strategies are of the sort postulated in the various empiricist theories. You can trace them back to Hume through modern psychology. Now, in my opinion, it's quite proper to regard these assumptions as purely dogmatic in the very worst sense of the word. That is, they are not based on any argument, they're not based on any evidence, rather they're asserted a priori. And for a very long period, these assumptions, the assumption that mental organs and physical organs are fundamentally different in this respect, uh, for a long time, these assumptions haven't even really been expressed. They've provided more or less the framework of inquiry, rather than being considered some kind of dubious uh, and arbitrary hypotheses that have to be justified. What has been assumed, in other words, is that these proposals, namely that cognitive structures are learned, language in particular, it's been assumed that these proposals constitute a kind of a null hypothesis, something to be accepted and less demonstrated to be false. But there is not the slightest merit in these attitudes. It's conceivable, of course, that they're correct. It's conceivable that the structures of mind alone in the biological world have the very curious character assumed in empiricist dogma but there's absolutely no reason to pay attention to this doctrine apart from history. That is, it's of historical interest that the doctrine has 
been held, but aside from that, it has no interest that I can see. In fact, one might go on, one might suggest that empiricist doctrine introduced a new dualism, which replaced the Cartesian dualism of mind and body that it opposed. Cartesian dualism postulated mind as distinct from body. The new dualism, however, of empiricism is methodological, right, by which cognitive structures are attained, doctrine which includes, which embodies, the specific and quite unwarranted assumptions of empiricist dogma with its particular variants like modern learning theory, modern psychology. In contrast to this methodological dualism, this a priori and dogmatic methodological dualism, in contrast to that, Cartesian dualism, that is the dualism of mind and body, at least adhered to the general methodology of the sciences. And that's worth bearing in mind. So Descartes, for example, as a scientist, argued that mechanistic principles could account for everything in the natural world apart from certain aspects of human self-consciousness and human creativity. And he gave reasons to think this. And he therefore concluded, logically, plausibly, that some new principle had to be invoked to explain the phenomena which he thought he had shown escaped mechanical explanation. Now, that's a perfectly reasonable approach. In fact, it's exactly the same as what Newton did, at least the logic is the same. Newton invoked the occult principle of action at a distance to overcome the limitations of mechanism, which he had demonstrated. Now, and that's logically, the logic of the argument is quite the same in the two cases. Some, the limitations of a set of notions are discovered, and therefore some new mechanism has to be introduced. For Descartes, mind. For Newton, the occult force of action at a distance. Now, in fact, we can see that Descartes' argument was flawed, but the general character of the argument was logical and intelligible. The same cannot be said of the methodological dualism of empiricist doctrine. This, I think, should be committed to Hume's flames. I've been suggesting that language can properly be regarded as a kind of a mental organ, and that when it is investigated without dogma, what we find is that language is not unlike other organs, such as the visual system. Of course, its structural properties are quite different. There isn't any reason to expect that when we understand the structure and the function of the visual system, we can then apply these principles to the liver or to the heart. Nobody would assume this. There isn't any theory of growth of organs above the level of cellular biology that will deal with the liver and the heart and the eye in any general way. They have their own particular ways of developing. Comparably, we can't expect the principles of the visual system to apply to language, and we can't expect the principles of language to apply to other cognitive structures of which there are many. For example, our unconscious theory of the arrangement and behavior of objects in three-dimensional space, or the constructions of sensory motor intelligence, or our tacit theories of human action, or whatever. And there isn't any reason to expect that there might be some kind of learning theory that will deal with the growth of these various mental organs. In fact, we can be really quite sure that there is not. Why? Well, suppose, in fact, that there were a learning theory. Suppose that there were such a thing as learning theory. And suppose that learning this alleged learning theory could account for the things that we call learning, say language learning and say maze running. And suppose that it used uniform principles to account for these as postulated. Well, then a conclusion immediately follows. Namely, we have to conclude that humans should be as much more proficient than rats in maze running as they are in language learning, because the same principles are used in both cases. But this is just wildly false. In fact, rats and humans are about the same. Allegedly, rats are a little better in maze learning tasks, uh, obviously not in language learning. So it seems at once that there just can't be any general learning theory underlying these achievements. The immediate prediction is at once falsified. And there are other less trivial examples that illustrate exactly the same point. I think there's every reason to expect that as other cognitive capacities are investigated, we will find that the mind is constituted of a set of interrelated organs or faculties, each with its specific character, each arising on the basis of a genetically determined, determined schematism that severely limits the possible realizations and thus permits the development of complex and largely uniform structures on the basis of limited experience. Well, let's consider the next obvious question. Can we expect to find in other organisms any faculty closely analogous to the human language faculty? Well, it's conceivable, of course, but it's hardly very likely. 
In fact, if it were discovered, it would be a kind of a biological miracle. It would be rather analogous to the discovery on some unexplored island that there is a species of bird that had never thought to fly until humans suggested that this might be an amusing idea. The fact is that language must have enormous selectional advantage, no doubt about that. And it's extremely difficult to imagine that some organism, some species, let's say chimpanzees, have had the capacity for language all along, but had never thought to put it to use until humans suggested it to them. And there is surely no evidence that this biological miracle has taken place, despite some rather careless claims. On the contrary, what seems to be established is that even the most rudimentary properties of human language lie well beyond the capacities of an otherwise intelligent ape. The differences between human language and systems attained by apes are clear at the most elementary level. Well, to see that, just consider the five basic dimensions of inquiry that I mentioned before. Functionally, language, human language, is a system for free expression of thought, which is essentially independent of stimulus control, independent of need satisfaction or any instrumental purpose, and is qualitatively different from any system taught to apes. Structurally speaking, language is a system based on the elementary principle of iterative structure dependent rules operating on phrase structures to generate a discrete infinity of sentences with forms and meanings determined by highly specific phonetic and somatic principles. Every one of these properties is completely foreign to any system uh, taught to apes. What about the physical basis of language, the third point? Well, here, as I said, not very much is known, but the little that is known already indicates the crucial role of neural structures, which, as far as we know, just don't even have an an analog, a non-human analog. For example, the specific uh, language centers in the dominant hemisphere. There's very little, if any, evidence that even lateralization is, takes place in other mammals. Fourth dimension, as far as development is concerned, language grows in the child without instruction through mere exposure to a totally unorganized linguistic environment. No training, no language-specific care is at all necessary. Again, qualitative difference. As for evolution, we don't know very much, but surely it's reasonable to, to assume that language is a rather ancient human possession, which developed long after the separation of humans from other primates. At least the little we know certainly strongly suggests that. Hence, along every dimension of inquiry imaginable, even the most superficial examination shows fundamental properties that distinguish human language from any other system which is exactly as we would expect. In other words, no biological miracles. Now, that's not to say that studies of chimpanzee intelligence are of no interest. Maybe they are. One would assume, at least I would assume, that apes in the wild are capable of intellectual achievements that go well beyond the ability to acquire the systems that are artificially imposed on them in the laboratory. But even the latter might lead us to understand the nature of late ape intelligence, which would be interesting and indirectly then to learn something about the specific qualities of intelligence that underlie the use of human language and other specific human achievements. Well, last question. What can we, we might ask the question, are there other domains of human achievement that we could investigate to discover something about human nature? Surely there are. And I think it's clear enough where to look. What we ought to do is ask where humans excel. That is, we should ask, in what areas do humans seem to develop complex intellectual structures in a more or less uniform way on the basis of a highly restricted data? That's the place to look. Wherever some such thing is the case, we can postulate, we have to postulate, that a highly structured initial state is responsible for the achievement so that we can then hope to learn something about human nature, which is, after all, nothing other than the character of the initial state by studying the systems that are attained in a uniform way. Well, language is an obvious area, and in my opinion, at least, the major intellectual interest in the study of language lies precisely in this fact, that it is such a domain, hence can tell you something about human nature. There are, however, other domains. For example, dimension one, humans have quite remarkable perceptual abilities in certain domains, not in others. To take one where we're very good, consider face recognition. Any person can 
can recognize an enormous number, thousands and thousands of human faces. Furthermore, anybody can identify the presentation of a face from different orientations. In other words, if you look at a person from one view and then he moves, you look at him from the other view, you can say, yeah, same face. Now, that's quite a phenomenal feat from a geometrical point of view. And it's a feat that can't be duplicated with other figures, other geometrical figures of comparable complexity. And since that's true, it would be interesting to try to get an explanation, maybe to try to develop a grammar of faces, or maybe even a universal grammar of faces, <laughs> to explain these abilities. What I think it makes sense to guess, at least, is that at some stage of maturation, there's a certain part of the brain that develops an abstract theory of faces and a system of projection that allows it to determine how an arbitrary face abstractly represented will appear in a given presentation. There is incidentally some evidence that face recognition is neurally represented in sections of the right hemisphere, the non-dominant hemisphere. They are apparently more or less homologous to the language areas in the left hemisphere. And it also appears that this neural representation is delayed until past the time when language is fixed in the dominant hemisphere. And that if language is for some reason transferred, say because of injury, then face recognition is correspondingly uh, defective. It isn't clear how solid this evidence is, I hasten to add, but something of the kind has been reported and it could be true. Well, here we have a cognitive domain that ought to be susceptible to inquiry along lines of the language faculty. Are there other systems which are more distinctively human in character, more closely related to the deeper characteristics of the species that we hope to be able to discover? Well, perhaps so. One very curious property of the human mind is our ability to develop certain forms of mathematics, particularly those having to do with properties of the number system and with abstract geometry, with continuity and such notions. It would be extremely difficult to argue that these abilities can be explained in evolutionary terms. So, for example, it hardly seems likely that ability to solve problems in number theory played a role in differential reproduction, that Pythagoras had lots of children and that's why we're able to do it, essentially. <laughs> we might ask what the nature of these abilities, what may be the nature of these abilities. What do they tell us about the initial state of the mind? Well, presumably these capacities develop as a concomitant of other capacities that had selectional advantage, but uh, nobody knows anything more than that. However, we could ask more. We could ask, what is the initial state of the mind? What are the mental organs that enter into the general structure of mind? Uh, organs which should be able to explain why, say, human mathematics developed in the particular path that it did instead of some other path. No doubt these capacities lie at the core of the quite remarkable human ability to develop scientific knowledge in certain specific domains. Well, speculations of this sort raise further questions. My last one, I said that already, this is really the last one. Uh, where complex intellectual structures are developed in an essentially uniform way on the basis of limited evidence, we have hopes of finding something significant about human nature, since it's natural to account for the fact necessary, in fact, on the basis of assumptions concerning the initial state of the mind. Now, the history of science is an area where one might look to get some examples that may be illuminating. It's a fact that time after time, people have been able to construct remarkable explanatory theories on the basis of extremely limited evidence. Very often they reject much of the available evidence on quite obscure intuitive grounds as they seek theories that are deep and intelligible. And furthermore, although the creation of new theory is an achievement of the gifted few, Nevertheless, it has been possible, at least through most of human history, for other people who are less talented to comprehend and appreciate what has been achieved. And that's worth thinking about. What it means is that the move to new theoretical explanation can be made intelligible to all people, that is to all people, everyone who possesses Cartesian universal common sense. And that's a very remarkable fact. The theories that have been constructed that have been regarded as intelligible and generally accepted in the course of science have been vastly underdetermined by evidence, much as human language is. And here we have another apparent case where knowledge of vast scope has been attained on the basis of limited and until quite recently highly degenerate evidence. Applying the paradigm that I outlined before, we can go on to inquire into the innate structures of mind that make this achievement possible. 
what is the science forming capacity, that mental organ, that enables us when certain questions are posed to recognize certain proposed explanatory theories as intelligible and somehow natural while rejecting or just simply not considering innumerable other theories that are no less compatible with the evidence. That's what happens throughout the history of science. Now again, I'm not speaking here of the creative achievement, which is limited to the exceptionally talented, but rather of the appreciation of the achievement, which is a common human ability. The ability, that is to say, that's right, with some understanding and appreciation. It seems to me that in this case, we again have to assume, as in the case of language, or for that matter, visual system, that the human mind is endowed with some set of principles, some general schematism that characterizes the class of intelligible theories and that thereby permits us to develop systems of knowledge and belief of vast scope with very limited evidence. Now, I already mentioned that there's a logical relation between the scope and the limits of knowledge, a very intimate relation between them, and let's apply that observation to this case. Suppose that there are principles that make possible the acquisition of rich systems of knowledge and belief, as there must be. Then these very principles are going to limit the class of theories that are in principle attainable. It's conceivable, maybe it will even be true, that we will discover the principles that do underlie the construction of intelligible theories. We will discover, perhaps, the mental organ which underlies the science-forming capacity arriving at something like, say, a universal grammar of scientific theories. Suppose we can do that someday. Well, then, by studying these principles, we could determine the class of attainable theories. And then we could raise the following amusing question. We could ask, what is the relation between the class of humanly accessible theories and the class of true theories? Well, it's quite possible that the intersection of these two classes is very small. That is, that there are few theories that are both true and accessible. <laughs> there's certainly no evolutionary argument to the contrary. I, that is, again, there's no selectional advantage in having a brain that can discover atomic theory or something. It's been a, just a lucky accident that the intersection is, in fact, not null. Uh, maybe it'll turn out to be null. It may turn out that the intersection is exactly physics. One recalls a remark of Lord Rutherford that there are only two sciences, physics and stamp collecting. <laughs> There's no particular reason to suppose that the science-forming capacities of humans or their mathematical abilities permit them to conceive of true theories in every domain, or for that matter, in any domain, or to gain insight into the actual laws of nature. It might turn out, for example, that inquiry into what humans do and, what, and why they do it lies behind human intellectual competence, though a science of human nature could nevertheless be constructed by an organism that had different qualities of mind. That's a pessimistic conclusion, but not necessarily false. In investigating human nature, we are hampered by the barriers against direct experimentation, and there is always a lingering doubt as to the very possibility of gaining insight. But there are also artificial impediments to this inquiry, and these can be removed. I've mentioned some, for example, the dogmatic commitments that lie at the heart of the methodological dualism of the empiricist tradition. Avoiding these commitments, the study of the visual system or the study of language, have had some success in formulating explanatory principles that can very reasonably be attributed to the initial state of the mind, thus regarded as the theory of part of an organ, a mental organ in the case of language, one element in human nature. These results, I think, are of some interest in themselves, perhaps considerable interest, but perhaps their deeper, more general interest lies in the model of inquiry that's suggested, a model that I think can profitably be pursued in other cognitive domains. I think it's fair to say that within the past 10 or 20 years, the study of human intellectual capacities and the products of these capacities has undergone quite significant changes, in part in the character of the results obtained but even more in the success of this inquiry in extricating itself from intellectual shackles that have guaranteed failure. That's a slow, a difficult, and a necessary process, one that might perhaps lead to an era of really significant achievements in the study of human nature. Thank you.
In the tradition of the Institute, uh, Professor Chomsky has agreed to answer some questions from the audience. We'll try to control them. Yes. Question. If language, uh, let me disentangle myself first. If language isn't a form of communication, what have I been doing here tonight? Well, I don't know. That's for you to decide. I mean, I might have been communicating. I'm not saying that language can't be used for communication. Of course, it can be used for communication. But it can also be used in dozens of other ways and normally is. That's the point. What I was questioning is not that language is a form of communication, but that its essential purpose is communication, and that only by studying that purpose can we make sense of language. That's the doctrine that I don't see any way to make any sense of. Can we be certain that dolphins, for example, don't have a structure of grammar? Well, we can never be certain of anything in, in empirical inquiry. Uh, it has to be found out. And all I can say is there isn't the slightest particle of evidence that they do. Dolphins do have a very big brain, and they can do some quite remarkable things, like swim through the water faster than any object ought to be able to do. And it's quite probable that the reason that they have that big brain is like so that they can, say, adjust the surface of their body to conform to local turbulences in the water and so on, so that, in fact, a dolphin will swim through the water faster than you can pull it through the water if it's dead for some reason. That may very well be what the brain is for. Dolphins also have make lots of funny noises. Uh, in fact, uh, dolphins have the nice character, at least some species of dolphins can uh, talk out of both sides of their nose at the same time. And it's, it's, they uh, produce, they have a double passages, and they can produce all sorts of complicated signals. That's misled some investigators into thinking they're probably communicating. Maybe they are, though there's, I think, very little evidence for that. What they pr probably are doing is using some kind of sonar, one imagines. Now, it is conceivable that dolphins are actually communicating with one another. There's nothing that rules that out. Surely there are plenty of forms of animal communication, like ants communicate with one another. So why shouldn't dolphins? But we wouldn't expect, I think it would be extremely unlikely that, that the principles of, that emerged in these totally different systems have any relation at all to human language, just as we wouldn't expect that ant communication has any, anything to do with human language. Professor Kay. Yes, uh, Professor Chomsky, you assume that the sex differences were recently mentioned. Are there any sex differences in my use of human nature? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask the question. Uh, nothing that I discussed today suggested that. And, uh, I mean, obviously there are differences, let's say, yeah, okay. But uh, <laughs> whether the differences there's absolutely no reason to believe that differences show up in mental organs, to my knowledge. There are some differences. For example, it's been observed, say, that for some reason which nobody knows, girls seem to learn, like baby girls learn language faster than baby boys. Nobody knows why. Maybe. Just <laughs> call Now, I believe, um, at least some taxonomists, uh, except the fact that uh, scientists and taxonomy uh, cast out on these uh, boundaries, what do you make of it? You assume this discontinuity is uh, absolute and total and yet the same. Question, do I assume that there are absolute and total discontinuities between species in contrast to taxonomists who have denied this? I don't think there's anything that I said that would surprise a taxonomist. I mean, there really are radical differences at every level between species that have diverged. T take, take humans and other primates. For all we know, the divergence is millions of years. Now, in the course of that time, 
some very striking changes took place. For one thing, there was a phenomenal growth in the human brain. Other gross changes that took place are, for example, that the, human, the development of the human brain after birth is enormous proportionally to the development before birth as compared with other species. And there are other quite radical differences of that sort. Now, it seems to me entirely reasonable to assume, to suppose, that when gross physical changes take place, then massive consequences follow from those gross physical changes. We don't know, we have no physical theory to explain that. But it's perfectly possible, say, that there are some physical reasons now unknown that determine that, say, when you put 10 to the 10th neurons into something the size of a basketball, you come out with transformational grammar. That could be. If that's the case, or if something grossly like that is the case, then things, you know, just neuron packing, which increases maybe for selectional reasons, will lead to very striking differences in the character of the organs of the system. There's nothing in that that would, should in any way surprise a taxonomist or a biologist, a physicist, or anyone else. Are there any problems in getting an intuitive grasp of intuition? Yeah, there are plenty of problems. I think all we can try to do is get a scientific grasp of intuition. See, we cannot let, I think that's important to, I'm glad you brought it up, and it's important to stress. There is no way at all for us to introspect into the principles that we call intuition. For example, well, take the simplest case, the one that I mentioned, the one about forming questions in English. There's no way for us to look into our minds and find that that's the principle that we're using, any more than we can look into our visual cortex and discover that we have receptors, that neurons that respond to particular line orientations. We know the phenomena. We know the, you know, we can see the phenomena. We have the slightest way of finding out what the reason for the phenomena is. We can only investigate that question about ourselves the way we would investigate it about some machine that somebody gave us. You know, there's no other way to find it out other than the methods of science. We just don't, in other words, to put it differently, we don't have any privileged access to the workings of the mind just because it happens to be our mind, just as we have no privileged access to the workings of the body because it happens to be our body. Now, there is a very long tradition that assumes otherwise. In fact, both of the classical traditions that I mentioned, namely classical rationalist and empiricist traditions, both of them assume that you could exhaust the contents of the mind through introspection. That is, if you really paid attention, and you know, then you could find the total contents of the mind. That essentially is a point. Yeah, the observation is that if you speak several languages, the test of speaking a language fluently is if you think in it. But here we have to be careful. What do we, by, it's true that there is sense to the notion thinking in language. If it is true that we can distinguish ability to think in a language from ability to somehow use a language without thinking in it, uh, if we know a language badly the way I don't know French, let's say, then I can sort of sometimes say something in it which isn't too awful, but I know I'm not thinking in it. I'm somehow translating what I want to say in English. On the other hand, somebody who really speaks French and English too will be able to just think in it. It just comes out in French. I think that's all correct. But we shouldn't assume that when we use the phrase thinking in language, we're using the same notion as we use when we talk about thinking. I mean, there is such a thing as thinking in language. There's also such a thing as thinking. And I'm not at all sure that they're the same thing. Yes. Sign language, yeah. Well, that's a very, the question, uh, the question is, uh, what about sign language as, you know, sign language of the, of the deaf? What, how, how can one, what can one say about that in the context of uh, uh, these discussions about the genetic pro programming of, of language? Well, uh, 
I wish there were more that I could say. The inquiry into the language of the Gens is pretty recent into sign language. That is the serious inquiry into it as a system of uh, linguistic expression. There's some very interesting work being done by a number of people, and the best, perhaps, uh, Ursula Belugi at the uh, Salk Institute in uh, La Jolla. And what she's discovered, and other people working with her have begun to discover, is that sign language, of course, has some... So notice that sign language is, we observe, just among deaf children, that sign language is easily acquired rather in the way that spoken language is. That is, if you put a deaf child in the context of uh, other people speaking sign language, the child will pick it up pretty quickly. And in fact, this is a phenomenon which has troubled teachers of the deaf very often. A lot of the, I don't know about here, but say in Massachusetts, uh, I'm told, I don't know firsthand, but I'm told that teachers, that the schools for teaching the deaf have a theory that you shouldn't allow the kids to learn sign language. They have to learn lip reading. So what happens, I'm told, is that uh, when the teacher is around, the children don't use sign language because they're not allowed to do it. But of course, they know it perfectly well. They're learning it while the teacher isn't around. You know, they just sort of pick it up the way you pick up language. It just happens. You're immersed in it, and then you know it, period. So qualitatively, and then you can say anything in it, and it's very expressive, and so on. So qualitatively, it seems to have the properties of another mental organ. And it'd be very interesting to know how does it relate to the mental organ language. Well, undoubtedly, it relates reasonably closely. That is, there are translation procedures, but it also seems to be different. I mean, there are principles of sign language which just don't seem to have any analog in spoken language, like notions of, in see, one, one thing you can do in sign language, for instance, is use continuous dimensions, you know, to get more and more. You can get more and more by a bigger and bigger gesture, let's say. Well, you can't do that in spoken language. Spoken language is discrete. Uh, and there are other differences beyond that. And I think that's a very, very fruitful uh, inquiry that might be going on. Anyway. This means two more questions. I think she wants to. Yeah. What do you have in common about artificial intelligence and artificial Yeah. Ah. Are there any, well, there's no point asking me, but are there any results about hemispheric specialization in sign language? To my knowledge, no results at all. And it'd be very hard to find. Because, uh, well, uh, maybe you could imagine a modification of dichotic listening techniques through, but I don't think anybody's tried it. Uh, you, most of, a lot of the evidence that hemispheric specialization comes from language deficit, like, you know, aphasia and autopsy, but that, in order to do that, what you have to find is, well, you know, people who are aphasic in sign language who can then be, you know, maybe get childhood aphasia in sign language who can be studied after death. I mean, there just aren't any such cases, really. And because of the, it's a perfectly sensible question, and in principle it could be investigated, but when we are limited to the sort of natural experiments that the world does, it's very hard to find out. Maybe some experimental techniques could be discovered, like, say, dichotic listening, but I don't think anybody's tried it, at least not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, Professor Chomsky, in the matter of inquiring into the nature of humans, uh, would there be uh, any uh, point in uh, studying the, uh, as clues the fact that certain men in power used the word Poseidon and uh, Nike News and uh, private? Or if that's not uh, uh, rewarding, uh, would it be interesting to discover the nature of the language of men in power who habituate to these clowns? Question is, uh, would it be interesting, would you get any insight into human nature by studying the use of language on the part of men in power or people habituated to violence and their choice of words like Poseidon and Nike Zeus and so on? Uh, I would think so. I, in fact, it seems to me that some kinds of inquiry into depth psychology try to go in that direction in a way. Uh, it's not unreasonable to think that there might be answers to that question. I just don't know of any far-reaching principles. You can think of correlations. That is, it's not hard to come up with a sort of an off-the-cuff explanation as to why 
uh, people who were designing, you know, intercontinental missiles should turn to names of, you know, gods and so on. Uh, you can think of all sorts of, you know, sense of superpower and, uh, you know, whatever. At least that the Freudian psychologist. But the trouble is, it's very hard to think of any general structural principles that govern those connections. So, and it, given the nature of the things they're doing, wouldn't it be wise to find out? Well, uh, <laughs> see, there are a lot of things that would be very nice to understand, <laughs> but it doesn't follow that we're therefore able to understand them. 